All right, we're learning the Maimer Kol Yisrael. Kol Yisrael Yeshlam Chelik Leilam Haba. Where are, which chapter are we on? Four. Chapter four. Chapter four. Okay, in chapter one, we introduced the concept that there are two definitions of Elam Haba of the world to come. One is the spiritual world, which exists even now, which is the afterlife where the souls reside to receive their reward. Um, the other is this world as it will be after the coming of Mashiach, and specifically when it gets to the point of Tchias of the resurrection. And we said that which of those two is it talking about when it says Kol Yisrael Haba that all the Jewish people will be part of that? It's talking about the second definition, meaning the resurrection. Uh, we asked a question. Hold on a second. We know that when you say all, all Israel will be part of the resurrection, but Gan Eden is more exclusive. It's more of a, a, an exclusive club. And we were asking like this. Um, doesn't, it, doesn't it make sense logically that the ultimate reward is the resurrection, not paradise? Because the souls that are in paradise, even the highest levels of paradise, are going to come back for the resurrection. So why would we pull them out of that bliss to put them in something lower? It's only because the resurrection is even higher. So that's a little bit funny that the thing that's higher is for everybody. The thing that's relatively lower is more exclusive. So that was our question from chapter one. In chapter two, we asked a question, and by the way, how does it even make sense that the ultimate reward, meaning resurrection, should be physical? Physicality inherently entails limitations. And uh, it doesn't make sense that the soul's ultimate reward would, would be experienced in a state which is inherently limited, namely the physical state of embodiment. Then in chapter three, we um, we started to talk more about the body. That was last week, and um, the I, the idea that is a funny thing. It, we we learned it from an analogy to Torah. That Torah is the wisdom of Torah, the truth of Torah, the ideas, the abstraction. And then mitzvah is like the application, how you do it. And we said, from a regular perspective, Torah is loftier than mitzvahs. Like, the ideas are loftier than the practice. But if you trace it to what we call the shoyrish, to the source of it, the doing is higher, meaning godlier, than the theory of how to do it. So mitzvahs are loftier than Torah. And so, too, same, the same paradox. If you look at the soul and the body from the simple perspective, the soul is obviously loftier than the body. The soul gives life to the body. But if you look at the source, no, actually the body is greater than the soul. And that's why the soul is magnetized and drawn down and attracted to the body because it senses the superiority of the body. And in fact, we mentioned something really difficult to wrap our heads around, which is that when we speak about Hashem cho choosing the Jewish people, we are specifically talking about choosing the bodies, not the souls. Remember that concept from last week? Okay. And that's where we left off. So now we're on Dalit, chapter 4. Okay, and everybody is doing fantastic. I just want to reassure everybody, we're all doing fine. Don't get nervous. Because when you get nervous, you start thinking about what you're not understanding, and then you really do miss stuff. <laughs> so you, <laughs> you start missing stuff when you're afraid that you're missing stuff. Nobody's missing anything. You're all, you're all getting what you need to get. Okay. All right. Chapter 4. V'hina yidua, it is known. D'zeh shibahachi of the kiyam ha-mitzvahs kol yisrohem shavim. Regarding the obligations to do the mitzvahs, it is equal for all the Jewish people. There's not like, some people who keep more of Shabbos, or le I mean, there are, but that's in that's a descriptive statement, not a prescriptive statement. As far as the prescription, every Jew is obligated on the same level to keep Shabbos in the same way for the same time at the same time. Every Jew is obligated equally to not eat chametz on Pesach, to hear the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, to 
we can go go through every single mitzvah. There's there are not different standards for different people. Torah is uniform. I mean, I'm saying mitzvahs, mitzvahs. The obligation to keep mitzvahs is uniform. Everybody has to keep the same mitzvahs. Okay. Bahachiov delimit Torah. However. Regarding the obligation to learn Torah, yesh kama v'kama madre gais. There are many, many levels, many levels, as to what constitutes the obligation to learn Torah. It is not, by any means, universal. There are those who are called yesh ve'oyhel, the ones who dwell in the tent. Think about in like primitive times, where the structure was the tent, so... Normally, a person was out and about, I guess, um, dealing with agriculture. I guess that's where food comes from, right? So someone who's dwelling in the tent is uh, someone who's studying. So that's the term. Yeshve Oihel says that Yanki Vavino was dwelling in the tent, where, whereas his brother Asaf was out hunting. Okay. The Yeshve Oihel, Yesh, Yesh Lohem Pnai, they have more time. The way that they are obligated to adhere to the obligation of what, what is called you shall uh, learn Torah day and night is literally day and night. We're told you're supposed to learn Torah day and night. Well, what does it mean day and night? So for certain people who are able to do so, they can and must, that's the point, they must, they are obligated to literally learn Torah all day and all night because they have nothing else pressing that they have to tend to. Ubaliyasakim, but people who have enterprises to tend to, people who work for a living, yeitzim yedechevasam, they fulfill their ob- uh, obligation Bepedek echod shachris, upedek echod arvis, with learning a chapter of halacha in the morning and a chapter of halacha at night. So they learn Torah day and night by learning a little bit, tiny bit in the day, and also a tiny bit at night. Very, very different levels of obligation. And again, this is a prescriptive statement. It's not just saying the fact, it's saying what they're obligated to do. So when it comes to tefillin, the yeshve ahel and the bale asokim, both have to put on tefillin every day. They have the same obligation. When it comes to learning Torah, they have very different parameters which constitute what it means living up to their obligation. And the reason that we find this variance, because mitzvahs, as we mentioned before, are rotzen ha'elyen, divine will. Remember we, went, we mentioned last week this concept, that mitzvahs are an expression of divine will, rotzen, which is kasser, which is higher than, which is the crown, which is higher than the head. And Torah is a manifestation of divine, do you remember last week? Chochmah, right, which is, which is the head, which is the cognitive faculties. And here's a, a nifty concept, which is rotzen cannot be divided. Or rather, let, let me translate it more accurately. Rotzen transcends divisibility. Lamaila mischalkos means it is above division, which really means it transcends the very notion of division. Chochma can be divided. Somebody can teach a chochma. And you leave class and you say, I didn't get it all. I mean, I got some of it. I didn't get it all. And that's fair enough. Okay, fine. So you didn't get it all. You got some of it. <sighs> Ratzain is very different. If somebody expresses their desire, this is what I want. You cannot really say, I know we don't like hearing this because it sounds tyrannical, or ungrateful, but if I tell you what I want and you didn't do it exactly the way I wanted, I mean, the thought is very kind, it's 
very sweet of you. Thank you for the thought, but basically thank you for the thought. That was not what I wanted. It's not what I wanted. I'm not trying to be petty. I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to sulk about it. I'm not going to pout, but I'm just saying the truth. You can understand part of a chachma. You cannot be mekayim part of a ratzin. You cannot fulfill a partial desire. Desire is, this is what it is. Because the very nature of desire is fiat, it is what it is. It's whim. This is what I want. Why? Not a need. Not a need. A desire, which we've explained before. It's this really unbridled expression of who I am, my peculiarity, my idiosyncrasy, that this is what I want. So when I tell you this is what I want, I don't know, I want clementines. I brought you oranges, is that okay? Well, I'm not going to harass you about it. That's very nice of you to bring me something, but in my heart of hearts, privately, you know, like, I'll go tell my therapist, no, I wanted clementines. Why clementines? I don't know, that's what I want. I wanted clementines. Oranges are not clementines. That's not my, that was not my rot sign. Yeah. Is want and, and motivation the same idea? Like different drivers? Or well, let, let's call it desire. And it could be a driver. Sure, it is, it is a very powerful driver. You can call it a motivation. It's a type of motivation. So Chochmah is also a motivation. Right, right. That there's degrees which can get you to go towards or to not. Correct. So if you're driven toward something because it makes sense. Is an absolute? Rotten is an absolute, yes. That's why Hashem chose us and there's no argument that we learned about Right, right, That's why there's no wishy-washy. Right, that's why it is or it isn't. Right, but with Rotten is binary. It is or it isn't. Either it's either that's what I wanted or it's not. It is either you're satisfied or you're not satisfied. You can call it that, yeah. But to get to that, to that absolute, that's where the motivation is. Make sense? So uh, let's think about it like this. We're trying to relate to the idea that in practical application, there is this really wide spectrum of what it means to adhere to the requirement to study Torah. For men, we're talking about men have a mitzvah of Torah study. Women have a mitzvah of studying everything they need to know in order to do the mitzvahs, which includes loving Hashem and awe of Hashem and belief in Hashem, which is why we learn chassidus. But, and then also why you have to, have to learn practical halacha. But like I'm saying, even a man who learned all that stuff, he would still have to sit and learn, you know, go learn about a nazar, even though you're never going to be a nazar. Why? Just because it's limit of it's, it's an obligation to learn teira if, if, you're, if you're not doing anything else. So we have this wide spectrum of what the obligations are for Torah study. And then we have this very uniform code as far as what mitzvahs to adhere to. So the Rebbe says, well, you know the reason for that? That's, that's because of the difference between Ratzin and Chachma. That mitzvahs are Ratzin and Torah is Chachma. Ratzin is indivisible. That's why it doesn't lend itself to having different categories of obligation. Toyota inherently must lend itself to categories of, of, of obligation because it's already limited, or your experience of it is limited by your ability to comprehend it. I mean, you say, let, let, let's take away the whole notion of obligation for a second and just talk about the fact if we teach the same Torah concept to a room full of a thousand people, they're all going to understand it differently. Also, Torah is only for yourself. Okay, but, but th that's, that explains why the, those obligations... It's like objective. Hmm? It's like more objective versus subjective. Objective versus subjective. Like mitzvahs are objective and, and Torah is only... It's not truthfully subjective, but it's everyone gets it through their own lens. Uh, you, you could say it that way. Uh, you could say it that way, yes. Um, or it's a related concept. Objectivity and subjectivity are related concepts. And in this case, which one is which? Mitzvahs are, to be are more objectivity, objectivity right. right? Because it is what it is. Right. And Torah is more subjectivity. subjectivity, meaning each person gets what they get. Right. Okay, let, let's continue in the words here. All right, so the mitzvahs are Ratzin, which is Lamaila Mishalkus, 
Would we say those words right? is Hashem's chachma, wisdom. Uba chalkus. Chachma is divisible. Yesh leimar, so we can say, when the Rebbe says in a mimer, we could say, that means the Rebbe is introducing his own insight, his chidush, his novel insight. Shal derech zehu benegea lelimer atayr vekimer mitzvah v'payel. This same distinction also expresses itself in the way that we learn Torah and do mitzvahs in actuality. The fact that the mitzvahs are obligatory for, for the entire Jewish people in a uniform way. And we go as far as to say this, and in fact, not only is there a uniform obligation, which is prescriptive. You know what the difference is? I keep using these terms, prescriptive and descriptive, descriptive and prescriptive. Descriptive is just a description. This is what it is. It's not wrong or right. It is what it is. Maybe it's wrong, but this is, I mean, maybe it's not the way it should be, but this is how it is. That's descriptive. I'm just reporting the news. I don't make the news. I just report it. That's descriptive. Prescriptive is, here's the, the doctor is giving you a prescription. This is what you should do. It's making a statement about what is right, what ought to be done. So what we're saying here now is something very, very, uh, I'm going to say difficult to sell to a lot of people, but it's a gemara. So if you're pushing back against this, you need to look into your own heart. The gemara says that even the wanton sinners, the Pasha Yisrael, are full of mitzvahs, like a pomegranate is full of seeds. Of course, the famous story, which I hesitate to tell because I don't like being derivative and telling stories that everyone knows, but whenever I force myself to tell stories that everyone knows, 90% of the people are like, oh, I never heard that story. So I'll comfort myself with that. This is called meta, by the way. You're hearing my inner thoughts. Not all of my inner thoughts, because there are various levels of my inner thoughts, but this is just one level and back of what you normally hear. So the famous story is that there was a chassid from another Hasidic group who, was, who met the Rebbe, the Lubavitch Rebbe, and uh, the Rebbe asked him to relate a Torah teaching of this Chassid's Rebbe. So he said, my Rebbe was asking, how is it possible, the Gemara says, that even the wanton sinners of Israel are full of mitzvahs like a pomegranate is full of seeds. How is that possible? They're Pasha Yisrael, they're sinners. How can they be full of mitzvahs? So the Rebbe said, uh, you know, I had a similar question on that uh, Gemara, but from a little different perspective. If they're full of mitzvahs, how in the world can they be called sinners? Okay. How many people never heard that story before? Okay. Two people who raised their hands. Three people? Okay. Great. So it was worth telling. Okay. The point is like this. I'm going to stop a second. A guy calls me and he says, I shouldn't call him a guy, a very prominent person very accomplished, good person who helped a lot of religious families who have family members who have become irreligious. And he said, I need a source. Is there a source? Because I, I can't just say it from a feeling. It has to come from a source that I can tell these families to comfort them about their irreligious family member that some people, that's not their tough kid. That, like, they can be good and they can have a meaningful life without being from, without being religious. So I had a hard time understanding the request, and then finally when I understood it, I was like, oh, I don't know any source like that, but I don't even know why you need that source, because who doesn't do mitzvahs? And he's like, well, they're... they're they're, they're fry, they, they don't keep Shabbos, they don't eat kosher, they... 
they don't put on fill and like they they they're not religious. I said, yeah, but they still do mitzvahs. He's like, why? No, they don't do. I, I said, Gemara says, they're full of mitzvahs like a pomegranate. He's like, well, that's kind of homiletical. I'm like, I don't know why is that Gemara homiletical? I mean, it, it, I mean and it, even if it is, it's a metaphor for something. I mean, well, why, why are you dismissing it? Meaning, even if it's using homiletical language, the point is still a point that they're full of mitzvahs. We didn't get anywhere, and this is a really great person who I admire. So, but I realized that there's a certain indoctrination you have to have to take that statement of Chazal, of our sages, at face value. So I'm not going like, to get into an argument over here, because I, I think it really breaks the flow of the mimer. But the point is like this. Um, Chazal tell us, our sages, our holy sages, that a philo that even the wanton sinners are full of mitzvahs, like a pomegranate is full of mitzvahs. So the Rebbe is saying like this, interesting, interesting. Even from a descriptive perspective, even reporting just the news, it's the wildest thing. Not all Jews have a relationship with limud Torah. They don't know what Parsha it is. They don't know what a Parsha is. <laughs> you know the difference between not knowing what Parsha it is and not knowing what a Parsha is, right? They never learned Torah. But they all do mitzvahs. You say, what are we, what are we talking about? They do, they do mitzvahs. They never, the guy never put on tefillin in his life. Okay, you're right, and that is a problem. That's why we have boys standing out on the street corners, excuse me, sir, are you Jewish? We'd like to put on the phone today to rescue them from that status of having never put on the phone. Yeah, you're right. But it doesn't mean they're not full of mitzvahs because they're doing mitzvahs left and right. They're full of mitzvahs, like a pomegranate. And maybe, th maybe that mitzvah is more in Bein Odom Lechaveroi, in the social justice mitzvahs. Maybe that's possible where more of it's coming out. Or maybe even it is Bein Adam Lamakim, it's religious duties. Maybe it's the fact that when they're Saturday morning sitting and uh, reading a book, so for that hour they're not Mechal Shabbos. I don't know how it's calculated. The point is, our sages tell us that every Jew is full of mitzvahs. But we do not say every Jew is full of Torah. We do not say every Jew is a Talmud Chacham. That would, be, that would be ridiculous. It's not true. There's no such statement. It says when Mashiach comes, so the Amram says it's a matter of halacha, that when Mashiach comes, then the Jewish people will be chacham and gedolim. They will all be sages. Then we'll all be sages. Because then the, the knowledge of God will be <laughs> gained through empirical experience, not from the books. But at any rate, I don't want to digress, which I've already done. The Rebbe makes this statement here, that when it comes to mitzvahs, which is a Gemara in Chagiga, Mashain Kain, but not so in contrast, Belimer Atayda, when it comes to Torah study. Who Kiavshali Yais as Echsadim be Yisro Rak Bagiloyim. And the reason why there is that distinction is because when there comes to lack, spiritual lack, a Jew can only be lacking in Giluyim. How do you want to translate giluyim? It's a plural word, im. So what's giluyim? Revelations. What does revelations mean? And any New Testament comments on YouTube, you will be blocked from this channel. You want to hear a you want to hear something I'm thinking? Okay. There's a, there's a, this is the matter. There's a, there's a book in the, the, that uh, 
yeah, the New Testament called the Revelations. Um, the, uh, this is so, this is so cringy. There was a rabbi who needed jokes for his. I know this is not a joke. It's a real thing. Um, I know the guy. There was a rabbi who needed jokes for his high holiday sermon, and he, I don't know where he looked. He found something online and he thought, oh, this is a good joke. So he, he said that there was once a husband and a wife that were, they both wanted coffee and they were debating who should make the coffee. And finally the wife said, well, you, the husband, you have to make the coffee because it says so in the Bible. He says, where does it say it in the Bible? And she says, Hebrews. <laughs> okay, and he told the joke and, and I was like, Hebrews is not in the Bible. It's not in Tanakh. He's like, what are you talking about? So he's talking about the Hebrews. I'm like, no, Hebrews is the name of a book in the New Testament. Okay, at any rate. Revelations. Um, and no, I never studied that book, but I am aware of the names of the books because when they quote chapter and verse, they always say the names of the books. So that's how I know it from. Okay. That is a great question. So when we say revelations, and who's, revealing? who's revealing? God is revealing. And to whom is he revealing? To us. Isn't there layers of revelation? And there are le oh, very good. Of course, of course, revelation exists on a spectrum. More revealed, less revealed. Sure. And in fact, revelation is a process, so it becomes more and more revealed. Is that like under Chachma because there's like okay. So Chochmah is a form of revelation. In fact, Chochmah is the beginning of revelation. That's why it's called the Reishis Hishtalshlis, Reishis Chochmah. The beginning of Hishtalshlis, the beginning of revelation, uh, world building, is Chochmah. Revelation, you, you asked good when you said, does that term revelation mean in contrast to something else? Yes. What's the opposite of revelation is etzim. Etzim we translate as, as essence. No, no, no. Um, it's funny because when we speak about revelation, you just throw that word out and you think, oh, that's a good thing because this means, it means re revelation as opposed to concealment. But in Chassidus, when you use the term revelation, revelation is a dirty word. Revelation is opposed to essence. Giluyim is opposed to etzim. In other words, Giluyim is like what you get from the teacher, what the teacher actually puts out there. Etzim is the pristine concept as it really is in a way that could never be expressed properly. The revelation is like diluted? I don't want to call it diluted, but it's not the real thing. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's almost inherently filtered, Probably. even though revelation implies that it's unfiltered because I'm expressing it. But expression itself is already a diminishment of the real thing. Mm -hmm. like it, inspiration? Hmm? Like inspiration? It, well, why do you say that? Because it's fleeting? It's not directly. It's what you're getting. It's, it's what, what you're getting. getting. Yes. 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 So, revelation is fraught with subjectivity and with levels. Um, it varies. Are we talking about God's revelation? Yeah, we're talking about the revelation of godliness. Yes. So is that on God or is that on us? What are you, what are you saying? Is it on... You're, you're, Meaning, revelation, if we're receiving it, then we're the ones... Think, think about it like this. There's a difference between what something is and what something does. There's a difference between so what something is and what something does. What something is, use the term objectivity, subjectivity. Let's use those terms again and bring them back in here. What something is, that's objectivity. It is what it is. If a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, yes, it made a sound. What something does, that's what it puts out there. And that is subject to the 
experience of the one who is experiencing it. Yeah. So, Torah and mitzvahs. Which one is more etzim and which one is more giluyim? Torah is more giluyim. And that's why there are so many different levels of it. And Shiva and Panam. And Shiva and Panam. I didn't even think about that, yeah. Torah is giluyim in our relationship with how much Torah we learn. But, but the fact that Torah it itself lends itself to that mm-hmm. says something about Torah as an entity. Mm-hmm. Whereas mitzvahs are etzim. It is what it is. And that's why the obligation is uniform. And that's why, descriptively even, it can be said that all Jews do mitzvahs. Even the people who don't do mitzvahs, do mitzvahs. Which sounds like a little bit of like a, almost sounds like a, like a joke. But that's what it means. Even the, even those Yidin who don't do mitzvahs, they also do mitzvahs. In fact, they're full of mitzvahs. Why? Because if you're Jewish, you do mitzvahs. Because that's just, because that's essence. It is what it is. Mashain Kane, you cannot make that statement and say, if you're Jewish, you're a Talmud Chacham. It's not true. You may be a complete ignoramus. Because when it comes to Torah, Torah is Giluyim, and Giluyim lend themselves to what the subjective experience is. So one person gets more, one person gets less. And there are various different categories and levels. When it comes to mitzvahs, all Jews have a relationship to mitzvahs. I mean, there's individual mitzvahs. So, like, people could do sins and they could do mitzvahs. It's not the structure of a mitzvah. Well, each mitzvah is standing on its own, you're saying, is actually. We're speaking about right now Torah mitzvahs as, as modes of relationships, of a relationship. Mm-hmm. And we're saying that all Jews have the same relationship to Hashem through Torah, clearly. But there's a certain uniformity, a certain objective reality when it comes to the connection between a Jew and Hashem that is through mitzvahs. The certain universality. They might not be aware of it. Also. Well, they're certainly well, not they're aware not. of it, because if they don't know any Torah, may, they may not even know the Torah that gives them language to describe the mitzvah that they just did. No kavana. No kavana, no. But let me make a bracha. How could Talmud Torah then act through mitzvah? How could Talmud Torah <laughs> Okay. How could Talmud Torah be a mitzvah? Because we just said, yeah. So I think that's why it's on a sliding scale. That's when Torah becomes a mitzvah, then it is on a sliding scale so that everybody can equally do it. <laughs> of course you can. Every, it's, all, it's all. Don't don't be so rigid. Yeah, something can be chachma and rotzen at the same time. Look, we already said that our relationship with Hashem is primarily His choosing our body, but at the same time we have a relationship with Hashem through our soul. So that both both things are happening simultaneously. Okay, but at any rate, what did we just say? We said very powerful statement. That it's only possible, I'm just going to reread these words here. When it comes to a Jew, the only lack that he could have would be in the Giluyim department. I'm sorry. But since the mitzvahs are an expression of rotzain, which is connected to the body, which is what is the object of Hashem's choosing. Lachin, therefore, in Yenzeh became a mitzvah, the concept of mitzvahs, who b'chol Yisrael is present within all Jews. So, there can be a chesodin, there can be a lack in this area that is subject to variation, meaning Torah. A Jew can be lacking Torah knowledge. But there's no such thing as lacking mitzvahs. He's full of mitzvahs. This is what I was trying to tell this guy. He's full of obligation. He's full of obligation, too. Yeah, that's right. That's right. He doesn't execute on it. 
Well, we're making two statements. We're not just saying he's full of obligations to do mitzvahs. We're also saying, in actual fact, descriptive statement, he's full of mitzvahs. He had a child who walked in Eretz so then there are layers because someone who now is practicing is still full of mitzvahs. So yes. Yeah, that's a that's a fine question. So you're saying are there not then layers or levels in the practice of mitzvahs? And the answer is no. In other words, in other words, it is actually a misnomer to describe levels of observance. Because in truth, um, there's no such thing. Now, you're going to tell me this guy put on his phone to get today. This guy didn't. And, we're either bringing and I more clearly take that seriously because I'm taking time out of my day to go bring my tefillin along with me when I'm running errands and put the phone. Yes, yes, that's true. But I'm not talking about whether or not he put on tefillin. I'm not talking about whether or not that, that mitzvah happened. I'm talking about this Jew. There's no such thing as a Jew who is empty of mitzvahs. He's full of them, like a pomegranate is full of seeds. So, and, and that's true of even what you might consider to be the lowest level. So therefore, what are we saying? We're saying that there are no levels in observance. There are clearly levels in Torah knowledge. You want your teacher to know what you don't know. That's why he's your teacher. How do we understand it? Here's what you understand. You want to know how to really embrace this? And aren't we doing that when you meet a Jew who doesn't even know that today is Yom Kippur, and therefore he's been eating and driving, and going to work, don't just have Abbas Yisrael and say, well, he's still a Jew. Say, I am no more religious than he is. He is no, no less religious than I am. Now, if you're very narrow-minded, your brain explodes, you're like, oh, then you're saying it's okay that he's driving and eating on Yom Kippur. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is you're no more observant than him because you are keeping Yom Kippur. Is that different than no more Jewish? Like a Jew is right, a Jew is a Jew. A Jew is a Jew. Right. So precisely. So when we say this statement of a Jew is a Jew is a Jew, where does that really manifest itself in mitzvahs, not in Torah. Because you can't pretend that all Jews have the same level of Torah knowledge. And therefore, going back to the beginning of the Mimer, they're not all going to have the same level of Gan Eden, because Gan Eden is reward for Torah knowledge. When, you, when you're in paradise, you're relearning the Torah that you learned here, but you really understand it, and it's profoundly pleasurable for the soul. Well, whatever you learned here is what you do Hazara of up there. If you didn't learn down here, you're not going to be able to learn up there. So there are levels, and in fact, people who didn't learn anything, I don't want to finish the sentence, but they're not going to have anything to do, right? Okay. So, his chalkus, levels, categories when it comes to Torah knowledge and Torah learning. When it comes to mitzvah observance, a Jew is a Jew is a Jew is a Jew. They have the same obligations. That's the prescriptive statement. And in fact, even in the descriptive statement, Chazal tell us, they're all full of mitzvahs. You can't pack any more mitzvahs into there. They're all full of mitzvahs. So after okay. this world, we don't benefit from our <coughs> Okay, let's, let's, let's continue. Here. Okay, okay, let's, let's continue here. Let's continue. Because there's so many wonderful questions that arise that I don't want to... I'm sorry, we don't have time for that because I wasted time telling you my Hebrews joke. So, <laughs> sorry. Oh, okay. All the meta. All the meta. Okay. <sighs> All right. So we said, yeah, fine. That was the end of chapter four. four. <sighs> what time is it? I think we should do uh, chapter 5. Are we okay with that? Don't ruin it. <laughs> okay. Hey, chapter 5. Vizahu kol Yisro Yesh Lem Chelek Lingum Haba. This is what it means when it says. 
all Jews have a portion of the world to come. Which definition of world to come? This, the physical plane, when it is perfectly refined and the souls come back to bodies. Yeah. That's what that's what the Rebbe was saying. Also, yeah. But doesn't Torah so maybe refine? we're in that. Maybe this is it. Are we? We're in this. Yeah. Missing the revelation. This is not it. It better not be it. <laughs> so <laughs> very. <laughs> you make a very very good point, which we should which which we should explain to everybody else. And you're saying this from your Tanya background of chapters 35 and 36 and 37, that it is the mitzvahs which refine the physical world performance of the mitzvah with the body, using physical energy, employing physical objects, that's what has a refining effect on the physical world, which ultimately brings this world into a state of transparency where God is, the essence of God can be revealed in the physical world. Okay. It's not a revelation, it's just essence. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Very good. Not a revelation, just essence. That's right. And that's why it can specifically happen on the physical plane, because revelation is spiritual and you need to remove physicality. Essence is not hindered by the paradox of finite and infinite coexisting. That's the whole notion of essence. That's why, for instance, the, the, the Oren, the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, was enoi min hamida, was not measurable. Meaning you could measure it, but if you would measure from wall to wall in the Holy of Holies, it would be the same distance as if you would measure from the two outer walls of the Oren to the walls of the Holy of Holies, because it took, it, it took up space without taking up space. Himalayan Sovev. Yeah, you could call it Himalayan Sovev, yeah. Why do you like those terms? You tried to use those terms last week also. Whenever I can. You just like those terms. Okay, <laughs> fine. So, this is the meaning of what, what it says. All Jews have a place in the world to come. Even though, like we said, that the, the reality of this world in the resurrection is a loftier level than any of the spiritual realms, what we call paradise, Gan Eden, heaven. And nevertheless, all Jews will experience it. And that, that was what we were grappling with in the first chapter. How can the thing which is higher be for everyone, and the thing that is lower is more exclusive? So we're explaining it. Because Gan Eden is where you learn, you relearn the Torah that you learned in this world. But in the world of resurrection, when the bodies come back, that's where you experience the fruits of the mitzvahs that you did. So not everyone has taita, but everyone has mitzvahs. And since all Jews have a relationship with mitzvahs, all Jews will have a portion in that reality. Either you're, either you're back or you're not back. See, that's the whole point of it. That physicality is very either or. It's like, did you come to class or you didn't come to class? Now, did you understand today's class? There are going to be different levels. But were you here? Did you park yourself in the seat? Either you did or you didn't. One of the most profound statements I ever heard of, I heard it from a friend. and He didn't make it up. He got it from some quote book, but that's not where I got it from. He told me this. And it changed my life because I don't like being around people because I get overwhelmed and there's a lot of stuff I have to do to adhere to social norms and it's very exhausting. So I avoid places where people gather. Okay, everyone out. He told me this. You can fake caring, but you can't fake showing up. That's giluyim and etzim. Caring is giluyim. So there are levels of caring, how much you care, how a little care. And in fact, you can even fake it. But showing up, either you did or you didn't. Either you were there or you were not there. So when it comes to the resurrection, either, you, either you're there or you're not there. And if we say you're there, you're there. And we'll all be there. And we'll all be there. Comes to Gan Eden, this level and this level and this level. And even, even, the, even the fact that someone who's on one level and then goes to another level. It's all levels, levels, levels. 
Because that's the nature of Giloyim, is that there are levels. There's a spectrum. When it comes to physicality, it's binary. It is or it isn't. And that's the ultimate. That's Hashem's And that's the ultimate. And that's also, yes, that's Hashem's Ratzin. Okay, very good. So let's continue here. And that is specifically why the ultimate state, which is the resurrection, will be for physical bodies. Specifically, that was the question we asked in the, in the second chapter. Why should the ultimate reward be an embodiment? We know embodiment is limited. You can only be in one time, in one place at one time. Physicality is so limiting. So we're, we're challenging ourselves to look at physicality in a new way. Kikiyama mitzvah shaykh be'ikir lahaguf, because mitzvahs primarily are an expression of the body. You do them, like we explained before. And we could explain, again, the Rebbe's Chiddush, dezeh shagilu de'el matriya yi agam l'neshamas shislab sho'oz bahaguf, hu al derech maimer azal godol talmud shemevi lide maise. We can understand a little bit more why specifically the souls need, need to be back in their bodies for this ultimate state. We can understand it from that famous saying, great is study for it brings to action. There was a famous debate, which is greater study or action? Basically, Torah or mitzvahs. Torah or mitzvahs. Uh, that's what we're talking about here, those two categories. And the conclusion was, study is more important. But you know why study is more important? It's a loop. It's a loop. It's a logical loop. Study is more important because it brings you to action, which is another way of saying that action is more important. Because study is important in as much as it brings to action. If study would just remain academic, then it wouldn't be more important. So we're going to use that statement now to understand, to decode this whole concept. That through study bringing to action, Naisa godless be Talmud. That brings out greatness in the study. Meaning, there's a greatness in study that is only activated or fulfilled or brought out when it leads to action. And he says in brackets, like it's explained. In the famous series of my modem from the Rebbe Rashab, which was written in Tafrish Samach Vav, 5666, which is uh, 1896, that when you're learning something that you're going to apply practically, you work harder and you come to deeper understanding. When you're learning something that you know is theoretical, It's not nice to say it, but it can remain superficial. But when you're learning something that you're going to have to apply, like, oh, who remembers which bracha do you make first, Shech Yanu or, or Ha'etz? I'm just giving an, an example of a common debate that comes up in my home. When you're learning something that you're going to have to do, there's much more toil, you're into it much more. And you get much deeper into it because it's going to be actually applied. So that I was bringing out this concept. Here, what do you see? That the ultimate in Torah itself is through its relationship with action. Torah, that's, that's, that's the beauty here. Torah itself is more Torah. Chachma is more Chachma when it has a relationship with Misa, with action. So even the Torah ultimately gets, connect gets connected to action. By us, meaning, does it have more depth to us? Or because we let go of the theoretical thing before we... It has more depth to us. Because when we know it's going to be practical, so we take it more seriously. But that also, the Rebbe is saying here, indicates something about Torah itself. That Torah really gains its highest level when it is coupled with action, when it is brought, translated into action. And, and what, what's the benefit of action? The benefit of action, as we, as we said, that is the reflection of essence. That it is. It, that it is. That Hashem is. That this is. It's objective. 
It's not an experience. It's, it's the essence. It, it's what it is. And how does that relate to this deal with Tachonin versus that we're all already filled with mitzvahs, which is essence? So we're all essence. Yes. And now we're bringing that out. So mitzvahs is how we bring essence into revelation, how we bring re essence into revelation. That these things should become empirically evident. That God and Torah should not be philosophical constructs, they should be empirical reality. Which, when the body is resurrected and gives life to the soul, yeah, you heard me, the soul will receive life from the body, not the other way around what the condition of reality will be at that point is that we will be able to empirically experience God, which is why no one will teach anyone else anymore because they will all know Hashem, not through study. You won't have to study. It will be empirically evident. Like everybody who walks the earth has experienced gravity, so they will experience that God is the absolute reality and that everything is one with that reality. And you won't need to take a class in Shara Yechud Ve'amunah to get that concept. You'll just open your eyes and intuit that concept. Right now, yeah. we're all filled with mitzvah. Yes. So we're all essence. Yes. Filled with essence. Now, is this issue that we can't recognize each other's essence? But we don't recognize the, the essence. In this state, in so the, that's right. We do the mitzvah so that so, we have the revelation of the correct. Essence. So we're working on the fact that the essence should be revealed because that's the one thing when we say that Giluyim and Etzim are sort of diametrically, I don't want to say opposed, but distinct from one another. So the ultimate goal here is to bring Etzim into Giluyim. One of the, uh, the challenges of Etzim is it is what it is even when it's not apparent. So it can remain unapparent. So we're bringing it out into Revelation. Okay, let's finish off the Mimer. Valpiza yesh leimar. And now, according to this, we can say, another Chiddush. The Bemailas ha-toyda delasid lavei terasi shal Mashiach. The toyda that we will learn when Mashiach comes will be a whole new toyda. Now, chas v'shom, you can't really say a new toyda. Matan toyda was once, was once. Hashem gave the toyda at Har Sinai and it will never be replaced. Chas v'sholem. And yet, when Mashiach comes, the Torah that we learn will be on such a different level, it'll be as if, as if it were a whole new Torah. Shnei inyon. So there's two concepts here. Zesha'oz yagili d'shlei mesat Torah mitzad atma. One is, when Mashiach comes, there will be a revelation of the complete Torah in and of itself. And then, the mitzvahs, there will be a revelation of Torah through mitzvahs. In other words, two things will happen. Torah will be on a whole new level when Mashiach comes in, in two regards. In one regard, Torah itself, which is, let's say, wisdom, that wisdom will be more complete, more available, more attainable more revealed. The secrets will, will be revealed. But then there's another aspect of it. Torah will be more expressed in practice, in the physical world, in the plane of embodiment. And a similar thing can be said about the soul. In addition to the fact that the, the root of the soul will be revealed, the, the soul will benefit from the, the unique, distinct virtue of the body. Which is, as we mentioned before, what is the unique, distinct advantage of the body? That it was the object of Hashem's choosing. Hashem chose the bodies, not the souls. As we said before, choice cannot be compelled by any factor. The souls are clearly different, so there's no, that's not real choosing. That's maybe sorting, but it's not choosing. The bodies are all identical, so that's the choosing. So the body has that essential relationship with Hashem, not the soul. When Mashiach comes, the soul is going to get 
to be part of that relationship and it will benefit from the body. So when we say that instead of the soul enlivening the body, the body will enliven the soul, yes. And on a deeper level, what that also means is that the soul will be upgraded in a sense where it will also become part of that equation of being the object of Hashem's choosing and an expression of essence as opposed to mere revelation. The Rebbe concludes with a prayer. That's a quote from Tanya, right? Except the Rebbe turns those words from Tanya into a prayer. It says in the beginning of chapter 37 that through our Misa and Avaita, through our acts and our work, that's what brings about the perfection of the physical plane. So the Rebbe takes those words from Tanya and turns it into a prayer. He says, It should be Hashem's will that through our acts and our work, especially the work that we're doing to emanate the wellsprings outward. You know what that means? That's the famous story of the Baal Shem Tov, where he had an out-of-body experience, and Mashiach told him, he asked Mashiach, when are you coming? He says, when you, you saw Baal Shem Tov, your wellsprings, he referred to the Baal Shem Tov's teachings of Chassidus as wellsprings, are, are emanated, are disseminated outward. So the Rebbe says, through the work that we're doing, especially the work that we're doing, spreading chesidus. We will merit to learn Torah as it will only be learned when Mashiach comes. From the mouth of Mashiach. We'll learn, Mashiach is going to teach classes. Mashiach won't just be a melech. Mashiach will also be a rav, a great teacher. Because of Mamish, very soon. Hmm? I thought we're not going to need a teacher. Because it's, you know, oh, that's a whole other question. If all, and why are we learning? At, <laughs> very, oh, a fantastic <laughs> question. Which is, and if we just stated that when Mashiach comes and the world is completely refined and the knowledge of God will be empirical and automatic, then what will we need a teacher for? Why is Mashiach giving a class? That's a wonderful question which is actually dealt with in other Maimodim. Yeah, that will still benefit from a teacher, even though, to a certain extent, we will no longer need teachers. And it's learning yeah. what brings us to do the mitzvot. Yeah. And we need to be doing that now. Yes. What's going to be the purpose then of the learning? Well, the question is twofold. When Mashiach comes, what will be the purpose of learning? And also, what will be the purpose of mitzvahs? Hmm? Still Ratz and Hashem, yeah. Which means it doesn't change. So it'll continue to be Hashem's Ratz and we'll continue to do it, but we won't be refining the world, so why will we, why will we be doing it? What's the motivation? What? To gain a relationship? Because it's essence. It's the most natural thing in the world. And our bodies will express that effortlessly, automatically. So then why do we need to learn? Why do we le- need to learn? Um, now, we're learning. now we're learning. To do the Primarily, there are many reasons why we need to learn. But primarily the reason that we're learning is in order to be able to do In the next world, when it's already the physical world is already refined, and we're doing intuitively, right? And the body automatically is a chariot, and you don't have to learn in order to do it. So why are we going to be learning? Even in Gan Eden, they're learning. Even in Gan Eden, they're learning. Okay, so the learning that we will do when Mashiach comes will be will not be with toil. I mean, only now is Lima Toyota connected with toil. And that's why we get reward for it, because, you know, you're sluggish, you don't want to learn, you force yourself to learn. The learning we will do when Mashiach comes will be, to a certain extent, effortless in terms of what we currently experience. It will just be um, sort of a, 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 a native state of awareness. But of course, we'll be learning Torah. 
because we'll all be purely God conscious and climbing levels and levels and levels of God consciousness, infinite levels, in fact. How is there levels with this rest going? No, in Torah, Torah is giluim, there are levels. <laughs> of course, yes. So there are always, there will always be levels. But as far as rotzain, which is expressed through the body, that's either it is or it isn't, which means it is. We all, we all just be there. Right. Well, the physical is already higher than the spiritual, but it's not apparent yet. So then the mitzvot Say it. are going to motivate our Torah learning, whereas now it's the Torah <laughs> that's right. that gets us to that's do right. the mitzvot. In the that's right. So mitzvot. now, that's right, so it's Yosef and Yehuda, and who's on top, and who's subservient, right? You know this whole thing about Yosef and Yehuda, and Mice and Talmud, so that's a whole other mimer. So now, that's right, that learning brings us to mitzvahs. And when Mashiach comes, mitzvahs will bring us to learning. We will know through doing. We will gain knowledge through experience. We'll live it. We'll be an embodiment of it. What no pun intended. Says? What? Is that what Kavana says? Like you can do a mitzvah with Kavana What's the bottom line here? What's the bottom line? Like, what are we taking away from this? Hmm? So everyone's going to be included after Tzir Sanitian? So we might as well include them now. So uh, this is just my personal bias, and you came to my class, so you're always running the risk that I'll distort the message, which I hope I'm not distorting it. But to me, the, the bottom line is, I think I even said it in the first class. I said, you know, don't get, this is not a stump the rabbi about Tzir Sanitian and, you know, which body will you come back in if you had reincarnations, and, and how old will the body be, and what clothes will it be wearing? I no said that's not the point. I know, but it's I'm not. Very the, but it, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank God we got through it. I I think I even said in the first appreciate class. Appreciate the identity of every Jew. We'll appreciate the identity of every Jew and the preciousness of physical mitzvahs. So that's the bottom line here: is to, is to appreciate the power of the mitzvahs that are done by every Jew, even the most simple, unlearned Jew. And then, of course, the, the idea of, ex, of understanding the essential quality of every Jew. When you meet a Jew who's not observant, they're not a different category. They're not a different level. There's no such concept. It's holier than that. It's, it's, it, the bottom line, if I can give you like how to really translate this, is when you meet a Jew who doesn't observe mitzvahs, it's not just, okay, be nice, be gracious, be respectful. It's literally, there is no difference. And if you're, and I'm going to say a, a harsh word here. If your puny mind can't accept that statement as truth and also accept the fact that you need to help this Jew do more mitzvahs, I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you. You need more refining. You need to learn more. You need to expand your mind. Working. The Torah that you're learning isn't no, working anything. enough. Too much clip, I don't know what it is. But the point is like this. There's no contradiction between the statement that, yes, of course, we want to help every Jew do more mitzvahs. And the fact that they can't be any more Jewish than they are, than they are already. And that that is primarily expressed in the mitzvahs that they're already doing. Okay.